Welcome to Business Ninjas, brought to you by Write For Me, where you'll hear from business leaders who are out there growing their business and slaying it every day. Learn from the masters. Let's get started. Michael Bach, thank you for joining us here on Business Ninjas. We're excited to learn about your company and how you're helping your customers succeed. So let's dive in through the basics on uh, you know where the the website is, where people can find you, and where you're located. Yeah, so uh, the company name is CCDI Consulting. CCDI actually stands for the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion, which is a charity. And CCDI Consulting is their social enterprise for-profit arm. Uh, our website is ccdiconsulting.ca, and we operate in Canada, uh, literally from shore to shore to shore. Uh, we have people in, uh, in British Columbia all the way across to Nova Scotia and parts in between. And we service clients that are local, regional, national, and international uh, in our field. Great, right on. And maybe you could give us a little bit of background about your career arc and how you kind of came to arrive at the station you're at now. Yeah, I started my career in IT uh, and worked in technology, and this is going back uh, a few decades. Um, and I worked in the technology field in one uh, shape or form for a lot of years. And then about 17, 18 years ago, I was with uh, KPMG, the big accounting firm. I worked in the IT consulting practice and I, along with a group of other people, started Pride at KPMG, which is the employee resource group for the 2S LGBTQI plus community and their allies. And that got me the attention of the CEO, which got me a lot of uh, opportunity. And I said, you know, if we're serious about this diversity thing, we need full-time resources and I want the job. Right. And so I, I became the national leader for diversity, equity, and inclusion for KPMG in Canada. And I went on to be the deputy chief diversity officer for KPMG globally uh, for two and a half years. Wow. A and uh, during that time, um, I started to think about what the Canadian market needed in the diversity and inclusion space and, and event eventually started what is now the Canadian Center for Diversity and Inclusion um, and uh, and left KPMG and I've been with CCDI now for uh, ten years. It'll be ten years actually in February. Wow, wow, that's quite an arc. And I, so from that launch, we had it's great that you were probably able to see what the need was across a diversity of industries and sizes of organizations as well. So that's that's a yeah, great way to be able to start. The global platform really gave me an opportunity to at a macro level, then zoom in and look at a, you know, pardon the expression, but a micro level, it's hard to think about Canada in a micro, yeah. but um, really looking across and saying, we're, you know, we're the second largest country in the world by land mass. We are not even close to the second largest country in the world by people. We have a very, a fraction of the population. Uh, just to put it in perspective, there are more people in the state of California than there are in Canada. and. 80% of the Canadian population lives within 100 miles of the U.S. border. So um, it's a challenge, you know, diversity and inclusion is a very on the grounds thing. And it's very challenging in that in that size and organization. So I had the perspective globally that I could I could look back and say, hey, we're, we're missing something here. Uh -huh. um, and uh, that's where I started to sort of scribble on the back of napkins and and decided that this needed to stay in the not-for-profit world. But at the same time, I don't know anything about the not-for-profit world or didn't at the time. Yeah. So I also started CCDI Consulting with the objective of funding the charity um, through its revenue. Interesting. Okay. So that I was going to ask what the origin story was like, like how you started and then how that might have changed over time. So what was that migration like with the original vision versus... 10 years down the road, how you've scaled? Well, the original vision was I was going to start a for-profit consulting company. Yeah. And then as I started to list off the things that I wanted to do with said company, all of the things that I really saw a need for in the Canadian market, it became really clear very quickly that it wasn't going to work as a for-profit company. We needed it to be a nonprofit. Um, but at the same time, 
I'm not somebody who's going to go kind of hand in cap to people and say, please, sir, can I have a dollar so I can do diversity work? Um, it just wasn't going to be my my it wasn't going to work for me because I don't know how government funding works. I'm not somebody who really has a deep understanding of of uh, charitable donations and that sort of thing. But what I do understand is consulting. I've been in the consulting game for, you know, 20 something years. Um, so it it was a real natural progression for me to say, OK, we're going to start this social enterprise and it's going to fund the charity. Um, and it's worked very well. That's fantastic. And so this, you know, a lot of times we, we like to dive into what the competition might look like and how you're kind of differentiating yourself out. But I'm guessing maybe in your case, the competition might be doing nothing versus doing something. So how do you kind of think through how you position yourselves against other options out there? Yeah, yeah. We, we certainly have competitors. Yeah. But we have competitors in what I would describe as two different streams. Okay. There are the streams of the big consulting shops the Deloitte's and PwC's and Accenture's that would say that they have a diversity and inclusion consulting practice. But what it is, is one person who tries to do the work, you know, but really it's not a, a it's not like, you know, their tax practice or anything like that. Like these are, are small peanuts for some of these businesses. That's one side. The other side is single shingles the the solopreneurs the individual practitioners who are you know maybe there's one or two people within an organization um but they're doing their thing and we're in the middle we're 50 people um wow. we're an eight million dollar business um we are not playing in the same space as deloitte but we're also not playing in the same space as the individual practitioners yeah. Um, so we've carved out a, a very unique position um, where we don't have a direct competitor. We have these indirect competitors and we lose out on business to both sides of those uh -huh. of those streams. Um, but we have, I think, skills that are unique and scalable. OK. And then, um, you know, given the vast need are there there are places where you feel like you fit better into organizations whether it's the life cycle like um you know company size geographic footprint is there sort of a common theme around that or is it the sort of thing where just about anybody is going to need what you're providing and it's more of a you know are they ready or not sort of thing yeah uh, there's there's no theme uh, we've tried for years yep. to pinpoint our sweet spot and we can't largely because of our, I don't know, three or 4,000 clients that we've serviced over the past decade. Right. Uh, some of them are, you know, five to 10 people in one location. And some of them are, you know, I think about one client, 300,000 employees in every community in the country. Wow. Um, we, if you look at our industry list, it's every industry you can possibly imagine. Uh, public, private, it, you name it. It is, uh, it is, uh, there just is not a theme there um, that you can easily articulate, uh, which has pros and cons, truthfully. Sure. Um, uh, you know, the, the pro is we c we'll do business with anybody. The con is we'll do business with anybody and we, can, we can't specialize and say, OK, we're going to focus focus exclusively on the legal profession. Right. That just isn't uh, isn't an option for us. And so I'm guessing with that wide array of previous customers, your word of mouth is probably pretty strong. Um, how are you kind of reaching out to companies and educating them about what you have available and, and that sort of thing? Like, what, what are the channels that you're active in the when we started out it was very much my network yeah. um linkedin was my best friend i reached out to people told them what we did slowly but surely we started to build a business and then in 2020 may 25th of 2020 george floyd was killed right. and uh the flood began and we grew in size in 20, we, we tripled in size in 2020. Wow. Um, 
and frankly, probably could have gone bigger had we been able to find enough people to do the work. Um, the, the growth has been ridiculous. And it's moments like that in the zeitgeist that drive a lot of what we do. So it's George Floyd's death or Breonna Taylor, or Ahmed Aubrey. Um, it's, you know, issues like, you know, when uh, the Me Too movement began and Harvey Weinstein was, was arrested. Those are the types of things that spur a lot of phone calls to us to say, hey, we have a problem. Right. Um, can you help us fix it? Um, it's, we don't market. We don't have a marketing budget. We don't advertise. Um, we, we definitely have a focus on things like thought leadership and education. So continually developing content and putting it out into the world free of charge. And we do that because we want to be seen as the thought leaders. Right. And it's through those things that people come to us and say, hey, I read your paper on such and such, or I attended your, your virtual panel on this, and we would really love to do some training with you, or, or we're looking for a strategy development, whatever. Um, that's how it all grows. And uh, it's very, I, I would say it's organic. It, it used to be organic. Um, now it's just the, our reputation precedes us and the volume is pretty significant as a consequence. Gotcha. And then, so that, that's interesting timing, right? So you're driven by um, these zeitgeist moments, but also during the COVID era. So having an increase in demand at a time when, you know, there was an impetus to, to kind of try and shut things down as well, must have been interesting to navigate. So what was that journey like where you've got all this inbound activity that you have to navigate through kind of shifting uh, government, you know, advice on how you can or can't conduct your business. So what was that like? It was a complete and total nightmare. <laughs> I, I'll be honest, in the middle of May of 2020, my, uh, my head of finance came to me and said, should we talk about insolvency? Because we watched our, our, our uh, pipeline of business go from a nice, steady pipeline to zero overnight. Wow. Because, of course, as of March, everyone was shutting everything down. Nothing was happening in person. Everything was going on hold. And we genuinely weren't sure if we could survive. And then less than a week later, George Floyd was killed. And yeah. I think what that forced was a conversation around um, racism, specifically anti-black racism. But it also, you know, employers said, okay, we can't wait. This cannot sit on a shelf somewhere. We'll do it virtually. And that was one of those moments that, that I think really drove a move to, um, to virtual work uh, and to things like in um, uh, virtual instructor-led training uh -huh. because we just couldn't wait around anymore. We, we sort of hunkered down and said, okay, this is going to go for a while. We're going to have to figure out how we operate. Not us, but I'm talking about employers in general. Right, right. Our job was to figure out how we could service them in the same manner. Yeah. Wow. And it clearly works, right? And and so do you see projecting forward that people are going to stay with that methodology? Or are you starting to see ways to kind of branch out and do a hybrid model where there's more in-person and, and that sort of thing now? We're starting to get a lot more requests for in-person. Yep. Um, whether that's training or meetings, you know, people are really asking us to come in person. And that's been slowly increasing for the past, I would say, six months. That's great. And I'm frankly very happy to go back to doing in person. Um, yeah. Nice to have a reason to put on pants. <laughs> you know, go out and, and uh, you just, there's something about being face to face with a person and having a conversation that frankly, these, some of these conversations are pretty tough. And just being able to feel their, I don't want to sound, uh, just feel their energy and, and be in that space with them. Right. Not to sound too, you know, um, um, out there, but it really makes a massive difference in comparison to the Zoom checkerboard. Um, it's, right. it's just not the same. 
Yeah, and I would imagine that the your ability to have these serendipitous moments where, you know, after the meeting, you can have a sidebar conversation with somebody one on one or something like that, which in a virtual setting probably would be much more difficult to do. So, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Great. Well, thank you for spending the time with us. It's been great to learn about how you've navigated so uh, deftly through challenging times and are helping companies succeed with some really, really important initiatives. So we appreciate your time. Thanks for coming on the podcast. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. 